Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are just missing one speaker, so please give us one minute max, and then we will get started with the session. Thank you. I actually think um, we should start. So uh, once again, uh, distinguished guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to the afternoon session entitled The Role of Parliaments in Addressing Cyber Threats. Today is a very special day uh, because this is a kind of a culmination of a very long effort of work uh, with parliamentarians and engaging them in the IGF. And it is my utmost pleasure to be the moderator for today's discussion. My name is Teresa Horeisova. I work for the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise. Before we get into the question, uh, to the session, uh, I would just like to say a few words on the modus operandi. As you might have observed, uh, the session is being interpreted in all uh, UN languages, which is also an invitation to our dear speakers to bear that in mind and, <laughs> and speak uh, uh, slowly. Uh, we have uh, one hour and 10 minutes approximately uh, left. Uh, and uh, this is a session that will be a little bit different uh, than the previous parliamentary sessions, because what we are planning to do is to really have a genuine dialogue on the issues uh, that are at stake. Uh, before we get started with this dialogue, uh, I would like to first of all thank uh, all the organizers of the parliamentary track who we will hear from in their welcoming remarks uh, at this moment. Uh, as a first speaker, uh, we have uh, Lee Yunhua, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations, who will greet us via a video message. Uh, dear colleagues at the tech team, uh, would you kindly play the message? Thank you. I'm to see that many 
Uh, Mr. Under Secretary General, uh, thank you uh, for uh, for your support uh, uh, in this process and your leadership. Uh, I would now like to turn uh, online uh, to the Secretary uh, General of the IPU of the Interparliamentary Union, Mr. Martin Chungong. So, uh, can we um, uh, have uh, Mr. Secretary General uh, join us via Zoom, please? Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. I hope you can hear me very well uh, out there in Addis Ababa. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be with you uh, today at this. Uh, 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 we cannot hear. Uh, one second, Mr. Chungong. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead and sorry for the inconvenience. Okay. No, it's okay. Thank you. It gives me pre uh, pleasure to be with you today. And let me start by thanking my colleague, the Under Secretary General, who has just spoken before me for the strong cooperation that uh, we enjoy with UNDESA, especially in the context of the Intergo uh, Internet Governance Forum. Uh, the parliamentary track uh, at this uh, uh, forum uh, this year is uh, focusing, and rightly so, on addressing cyber threats. It comes at a time when our uh, international system of governance is under pressure. And uh, this is evident uh, from the IPU's perspective in what we do uh, day, to day, uh, day to day in contributing to seeking peaceful uh, solution to uh, resolution to conflicts around the world. And uh, just to name a few, you have Ukraine, Yemen, Libya, Venezuela, Mali, just these are some of the countries where we are involved and we are trying to use the tools of parliamentary diplomacy to try to facilitate dialogue and political solutions. And so I believe it is appropriate that this forum takes up the issue of cyber threats as one of the causes of instability in our digitally connected world. It is clear that we need a higher level of awareness at the political level of the threats that exist and coordinated action to counter them. We need to make good use of the international instruments that have been developed, such as the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime and the Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. The IPU is making an active uh, contribution to the discussion on a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of ICT for criminal purposes. On 6 uh, December, we will hold an online discussion to hear the views of parliamentarians from around the world as part of our role to provide a parliamentary voice to this UN process. We are keen to ensure that this instrument is grounded in human rights principles. I would like to note that the title of the IP event on 6 December is Creating a Safe Cyberspace for Democracy. Because this is uh, truly what is at stake, whether we are able to have a cyberspace in which democracy can flourish and international governance can be strengthened. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the IPU's Committee on Peace and International Security is preparing a, a resolution that will express the position of the international parliamentary community on the new risks to global security that represent cyber attacks and cyber crimes. I acknowledge the participation in the parliamentary track at uh, this IGF of one of the rapporteurs of that resolution, Mr. Jose Cepeda of Spain. 
he will certainly want to make the connections with the discussions taking place this week. I want to believe that the conclusions from today's roundtable and the three sessions of the parliamentary track that have already taken place will form another step in the process of building the political will to take action to address cyber threats and create a safe internet for everyone. I thank you and I'm looking forward to the conclusions of your deliberations. Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much uh, for those kind and encouraging uh, words. Thank you. Now, uh, let me invite in person very valued guest, uh, Mr. Tagese Shafo, the Speaker of the House of the People's uh, Representation here in Ethiopia. Please join us here on the stage. Uh, well, uh, let me express the regrets of uh, the Speaker of uh, the House of People's Representatives. He couldn't be here. He is, I, so I am representing him. Uh, I'm a member of Parliament and I chair the Foreign Affairs, the Foreign Relations and Peace Affairs Standing Committee of the Federal Parliament. Thank you very much. Well, distinguished delegates, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the House of People's Representatives of Ethiopia, I would like to welcome you all to Ethiopia and uh, the parliamentary track of the IGF 2022. Uh, let me take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who have come to Ethiopia to participate in the IGF 2022. And I thank the organizers and uh, of the IGF and the parliamentary track in particular for their efforts to make this uh, meeting convened successfully. I'm very glad to acknowledge the presence of parliamentarians and other high level participants and delegates, as well as participants representing various institutions. Dear participants, uh, allow me to begin my remarks uh, by indicating the role of parliaments in the digital space. As technology is changing fast, the legal and regulatory framework also needs to cope up. As a result, parliaments are places where legislation, including those of the internet and the digital space are developed and parliamentarians are important players in the debate about internet governance and digital policy. I'm pleased that the IGF is a place for parliamentarians to, en in, to engage with other stakeholders and exchange knowledge and best practices uh, and pressing issues pertaining to the use, evolution, governance of the internet and, di and digital technologies. The objective of today's meeting is strengthening the role of parliaments in the dialogue in internet governance, particularly through expanding the set of intersessional activities dedicated to fostering interparliamentary dialogue and cooperation on key digital policy issues, activities dedicated to fostering interparliamentary dialogue and cooperation. As you all are aware, the internet offers an opportunity to keep growth and ensure that every citizen benefits from a more prosperous future. Ethiopia has made great strides towards developing a digital economy, but it has yet to tap into its digital potential and use the internet to build a more prosperous society. We believe our country needs urgent, bold, and coordinated action to harvest the benefits and ensure digital transformation. Yet leveraging internet 
and the other digital technologies demands a new mindset and leadership style from lawmakers. As these are opportunities, as there are opportunities, there are also challenges. Since, uh, and the safety, the safety of the internet and the role of governments uh, is of course of, of concern. There is a clear governmental obligation to ensure that the digital space is a safe place as more people live their lives online. This requires political leadership to take on challenges of the era. Allow me to use this opportunity to highlight some of what uh, some of the Ethiopian government's initiatives in relation to this concern. Our parliament encourages the government to invest in research and development of future and emerging technologies, as well as create an enabling environment for entrepreneurs. The parliament of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia has been addressing issues like consumer protection, content policy, data security, privacy, and others and other areas of concern in, in recent years. Among the legal frameworks uh, we have so far implemented are those that address cyber crime, regulating hate speech, electronic uh, transactions, and so forth. <laughs> in our proclamations, efforts are made to maintain balance between fundamental human rights, such as privacy and the right to freedom of expression and access to information, while also taking into account other important values, such as consumer protection, innovation, and business freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, lastly, finally, uh, I wish you a successful uh, on-site and virtual meeting. The Parliament of the Federal Democratic Ethiopia of Ethiopia remains committed to ensure that the internet and the broader digital space remain open and at the same time safe and secure. And reaffirm that the resolution to digital policy challenges need to be human-centric and have users at their core. We wish you all the best during these deliberations and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for uh, sharing with us uh, uh, the words uh, of the Speaker of the Ethiopian Parliament. Uh, it's very appreciated. Uh, so I would like now to continue with the discussion that we have with a very excellent panel here uh, that actually uh, also demonstrates the kind of multi-stakeholder <laughs> dimension of the work that has been happening uh, throughout the parliamentary track uh, here at the IGF. Because we do have some members of the parliament with us uh, and we also have other stakeholders with us. So uh, if you allow me, uh, I would take it uh, from, from the farthest uh, speaker um, here, which is uh, Mr. Edmond Chung, uh, member of the ICANN board and the CEO of Dot Asia. I also uh, have with me here and other panelists, Mr. Samuel, Samuel George, member of the parliament in Ghana, welcome. Mrs. Mia Petra Kumpula Natre is the member of the European parliament. Uh, I follow here uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Carlos Sebastian Garcia, uh, member of the parliament of Paraguay. And uh, last but not least, Mr. Jimson Olufie uh, from the Africa ICT Alliance based in Abuja. Welcome. There are a few questions uh, that I would like to discuss with you and uh, hear your inputs. Uh, they All of them relate uh, to the IGF uh, or uh, related issues and the role of the national uh, parliaments, especially in addressing uh, cyber threats. Uh, the first question I would like to uh, ask you is, what roles do you think parliaments can or should play in addressing cyber threats and fostering strengthened multi-stakeholder cooperation at uh, national, regional, 
and international level. So we do not have this prepared <laughs> too much. So it really should be a conversation. So I would like to uh, ask you um, uh, who would like to start. <laughs> Jimson, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Teresa. And greetings, uh, everyone, colleagues. Uh, it's really great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think the first thing to do is to uh, define what is cyber uh, threat. Uh, cyber threat is uh, characterized with uh, adversaries that have potential of inflicting pain or losses on us. It could be financial or it could be reputational losses. So they have capability, they have intent and opportunity, and we need to watch out uh, for them. So this discussion is very, very uh, important. Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, you know the parliamentary uh, importance in this regard, uh, because of self-interest, I think parliaments need to take this very seriously. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, democracy has been flourishing for quite a while now, and uh, we from the private sector we wanted to continue to succeed, and I believe for many other uh, parliamentarians and other countries. So it's very important, just like the Secretary of IPC, uh, International Interparliamentary uh, Union mentioned, democracy needs to be sustained. And uh, cyberspace is a challenge because of fake news, uh, because of uh, infiltration to our data system, uh, and all sort of uh, misinformation. Um, the, the parliament, of course, like in Nigeria, we have various committees they are responsible for appropriation of uh, budget. So if we don't take care of the threat issue, it will affect the bottom line, okay? So that's why the ICT committee, the cybersecurity committee, the finance committee uh, need to, to take proactive roles in engaging uh, private sector, engaging all stakeholders, and what do we need to do? So laws is very important. And uh, if you come up with cybersecurity law that uh, enables you know, compliance, oversight, that will go a long way. Uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, UNECA launched uh, the uh, model law of uh, cybersecurity for African countries. That will help a lot. So we can uh, check it up. You can check it with uh, existing cybersecurity uh, law and see improvement we need you know, uh, to do. And uh, even Interpo said that we lose 10% of our GDP to cybercrime. Which is so, a very, very huge number. Yeah, so know. that's why we, we need to uh, take, uh, take a look at uh, the law to ensure that we reduce our losses. In fact, there was another study that showed that um, uh, if we take cyber security seriously, about uh, 0 0.66 to 5.4% uh, uh, increase in GDP will result when we improve on our cyber security maturity. So there is a relation with the cyber security maturity and development. So these Thank are you. very clear uh, indices to let us know parliamentarians that we need to take this threat very seriously. Thank, Thank you very much. That was that was useful, uh, especially hearing from you as different stakeholder that was a member of the parliament. Sebastian, do you have any reflections on, on this one, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts. And thank you to the organizers for, for having us here today. In the first place, from a parliamentary point of view, it's important that members of parliament learn <clears throat> what cyber threats are. For, uh, bringing it from a technical point of view to a political and maybe a more humane point, point of view, meaning that it has to, we, uh, we have to understand implications from a sovereignty point of view, from a defense point of view, to a citizen daily life point of view, and understand what the possible consequences are. And from that point on, open spaces for conversations to try to be proact to proactively anticipate to things that could happen. Uh, we have a, a big, big challenge, which is bringing uh, issues concerning cyber threats, cybersecurity to a mainstream political debate, considering it is currently seen as something, something more likely technical. So bringing it to the political debate would be really helpful to enrich and to, uh, to to uh, give it the proper uh, support it needs, also from a budget point of view. 
uh, which is which is a relevant point to mention as well. Uh, Mia Petra, would you like to uh, reflect as well? Thank you. Um, representing European Parliament here, it means that we do legislate, give budgets also on the level of the 27 countries, uh, whereas there are also uh, 27 national legislation. But then understanding cyberspace is something that doesn't respect that much national borders. We feel a kind of proudness that having a little bit bigger shoulders also when it comes to the difficult legislation. The one we are doing now is also on the equipment cybersecurity uh, requirements. And I hope once there is a one market of uh, 440 million people, almost one fifth of the global markets, then can spread when the companies are providing better equipment with a better cybersecurity. But then also I think uh, the role of the, for the parliaments and multi-stakeholder is to look at your society. We are responsible of the safe so society and it doesn't matter if it's uh, safety also only offline, if your online world is threatened. It doesn't really make difference if your water or energy is bombed down like it happens in Ukraine or if there is cyber attacks from the Russia to cut off the uh, electricity. So this kind of security has to be understand also to prevent and be resilient for the risk of the society. And I very much agree with the colleague from Paraguay that uh, it's not enough if it's engineers who happen to be members of the parliament. Like we talked uh, with the many that we happen to be engineers. We want uh, the people on the educational committee, people on the health committee, people on the national security committee have this readiness not to be the engineer, but to be aware that without digitalization there is no development but the digitalization brings along this cyber life which also needs to be safe otherwise we pay too much thank you very much mia petra that was certainly appealing samuel a few reflections on that maybe well, well let me say thank you to the organizers of this session and to my co-panelists i think that the points that have been made are very succinct as members of parliament we have a responsibility to our constituents we have direct contact with the citizens as we represent them in parliament. And like Mia Petra said, we have a responsibility to keep them safe, not just offline, but online. How we can do this is by using laws and passing legislations that will institutionalize the fight against cybersecurity. It's high time if there's any country right now that doesn't have a cybersecurity authority, um, then you are sleeping and we'll urge you to wake up. Ghana did same in 2020 when we passed Act 1038, the Cybersecurity Act of Ghana, which basically set up a cybersecurity authority and did not just put it under the Ministry of ICT and Communications, but also made the head of the cybersecurity authority and the minister part of the joint national security architecture. So it's no longer just the Ministry of Communication issue, but it's also viewed as a national security issue, and that gives more prominence to cybersecurity. Another thing we need to do is because cyber threats and, 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 and attacks are not border, bordered, they're borderless, they come across. You need to work with other key stakeholders across the, the spectrum. There are several key, key stakeholders who we need to engage with from time to time. And then we also need to pass the international protocols, which then enable us. So the Budapest Convention, sadly the Malabo Convention, which has been signed by almost all African countries, but we have only 14 of us who have ratified it. That's a problem. And so the Malibu Convention, eight years old, has not yet been triggered because we still need one more country. Maybe we should use this platform to urge all African parliaments to go ahead and sign and ratify, ratify the, the Malibu Convention so we can trigger it. And you, can, you don't have to sign up ratify the whole convention you can ratify with reservations if there are portions of the convention that you're not comfortable with but these are all conventions that were signed up by our presidents and so they should be comfortable with it and let's get parliaments to to improve it the last thing i want to say is that as parliamentarians i think as part of even our town hall engagements we must begin to teach cyber hygiene to our citizens. Africa is beginning to increase its cyber footprint with a lot of e-services that government is offering and we're asking our citizens to go online but many of us don't even have data protection laws in place to protect them. We have not done cyber hygiene awareness campaigns as government. And so it's important that as members of parliament and as parliaments as a body, we begin to prioritize the issues of cyber hygiene awareness amongst our citizens.
Samuel, thank you very much. Uh, let's stick a little bit longer with the roles and responsibilities, but um, also mention the responsibilities of other stakeholders. Yes, uh, it was uh, actually quite reassuring to hear you members of the parliament express the responsibilities you feel uh, that you have. But Edmond, what about other stakeholders, if I may ask you for your opinion? Right. Um, thank you, first of all, for, for having me. Um, very excited to hear parliamentarians uh, willing to, to, to participate in this, this discussion. I think um, uh, rather than you know other other roles, sometimes you 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 know obviously uh, uh, um, institutions like ICANN or IETF they don't create laws, right? I mean, obviously uh, parliamentarians uh, 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 do, but they don't uh, develop and operate the internet. Um, so there are many roles that that different uh, uh, stakeholders need to play in the internet governance uh, community. Then um, one of the things that I think is a very important for internet is that really trust is is the thing that binds the internet and gives us the one internet. And when we um, uh, uh, when we do something like you know uh, uh, digital sovereignty, for example, is a very you know a big concern for many uh, governments. Uh, but if you apply that, if you try to apply that down to a technical layer, then there might be threats. In fact, it creates threats. When you try to introduce uh, uh, incompatible protocols or standards, when you try to um, uh, replace multi-stakeholder model uh, uh, operational protocols with legislation, then you actually create a, a you know a, a, a problem and create a threat, and you breach the little bit you know the trust in the technical community. Uh, we often like to say that there is no protocol police, right? I mean, nobody nobody uh, enforces, but that's how the internet works. So I think one big part of it is how we work together. Uh, and allow me to tell off a little bit uh, here to talk about, you know, there are certain threats like um, uh, a, a different type of threat on online, such as um, the internet's own internet uh, 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 identifier system, the domain names and email addresses not being able to use be used with native languages. Right now, is still only English and. This is one of the threats that actually all the players, uh, all the stakeholders can come together right quite well. Uh, governments uh, can can create procurement processes to 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 get a system integrators to implement uh, multilingual domain names and email addresses. Parliaments can reinforce that with legislation that support the open uh, and. Uh, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, standards bodies, uh, the technical industry, the 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 um, the civil society can adopt the the standards roadmap, and I think these are some the some of these things uh, can actually you know really hopefully illustrate and uh, how the different stakeholders can actually come together uh, and build a better internet. Edmund, thank you very much, especially for stressing also the role of the technical uh, community. Now, Andrietta, and I have to introduce uh, Andrietta Esterhuizen, uh, who joined us a little bit later from, from the Association for Progressive uh, Communications. But Andrietta, uh, you're quite well placed uh, to share with us what you think is the roles and responsibilities of civil society uh, in addressing cyber threats. Um, thanks very much, Teresa. My apologies for, for being late, everyone. Um, I think it may be just to take a small step backwards because uh, before lunch, we had the main session on enabling safety and security online in the same room. Um, I think one of the challenges we're dealing with now is that we, I think there's an understanding that we need a holistic approach to, to cybersecurity. But I also think we still have much to do in terms of defining the concept as one of the participants in our session said, and what our respective roles are and how we can contribute. I think civil society has a really particular role in um, demystifying what the impacts of cybersecurity is and what the nature and the range of the threats are. Um, the, the fact that many cybersecurity threats actually target not state institutions, but individuals, small businesses, and clinics, people that are delivering public services or social services at the community level. Um, the other thing I think civil society can help reveal is that insecurity impacts different people differently. Gendered disinformation, for example, um, um, impacts 
people of different genders or different sexes differently. And I think, so that level of introducing evidence of the diversity of cybersecurity threats, the, the diversity of impacts that those threats have, um, certainly I think can, can, can inform um, cybersecurity de debates. If we want to have a whole of society uh, approach, I think civil society can also reveal some of the, 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 the threats that come from cyber securing efforts, the threats of violating human rights, introducing efforts um, to establish security through surveillance that don't respect fundamental human rights that might put journalists or activists at level. I think we even heard from parliamentarians that in, in many multi-party democracies, opposition politicians are sometimes um, abuse, their, 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 their privacy um, and, and confidence of their security is abused by surveillance, which is taking place under the guise of establishing cybersecurity. So I think that civil society ultimately can, and I think collaborate with parliaments in ensuring accountability and oversight. I think, so I would say that evidence, impact and oversight. Thank you very much, Andrea, and also for the leadership that you personally and your organization uh, has uh, in, this, in, in this space, working with civil society. Any other reflections on the roles and responsibilities of other stakeholders? Jimson, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, from the private sector uh, perspective, uh, we all do know that uh, at this point in time, we are collaborators, we work together with other stakeholders, uh, such that private sector has invested so much into the infrastructure, e-commerce, at the technical layer, the private sector has put resources down. And as such, they have vested interest in ensuring that uh, it remains secured and safe. In fact, uh, the UNECA uh, research I talked about earlier shows a strong correlation between cybersecurity and internet penetration. And so parliament uh, need to always see the private sector as uh, you know, stakeholders as partners in improving the, the security maturity of the nation. We are partner in progress. Not only that, because uh, we're talking about development, jobs. We provide a job. We are job creators. And that's why for any law they need to create, they have to consult with us. And we are ready we, to, to, to relate. We have a number of frameworks, but we also need to uh, enact law that ensure that we are accountable. Okay, so that we can comply with standards, you know, standard for audit, standard for cyber uh, intelligence, uh, because that is very important for national security. Especially like a country in Nigeria where election is coming up and there's all sort of uh, news going on. So there has to be some collaboration to ensure that mechanism for knocking out uh, fake news, you know, is put in place. So private sector is always ready to ensure that uh, the uh, national security, ensure that there is more businesses, to ensure that more jobs are created. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for bringing Samuel, please go ahead. Yes, I, I think a lot of my colleagues on the panel have spoken about the role of private sector, but we, we tend to look at parliament and say government, but then the different layers of government. And even when it comes to legislation, parliament can only be triggered when the executive takes the initiative because of the national security implications. Again, the threats in the cyber world are multi-layered and multifaceted. From the little kid sitting in the garage in his room and just running DNS attacks to state-sponsored attacks. And so private sector in itself is limited if the executive arms of our governments do not begin to play, pay, pay critical attention putting in place the infrastructure, including computer emergency response teams, sectoral sets in various aspects and, of, of national livelihood. And so it's extremely important that when we're talking about the multi-stakeholder approach, yes, parliament is one, but the executive governments, executive governments themselves, presidents, prime ministers have a responsibility to play in initiating and placing this front and center of national policy. Private sector will continue to do its part of, 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 of engaging with us to make sure that the, the legislation that the executive brings to parliament is reflective of, first and foremost, protection for the citizens. Because when you're talking about protection in the cyber world, the two, protection of the state and protection from the state. Because the state has a responsibility to ensure that the cyber world is safe enough for its citizens, 
But then the role of private sector in the, in the le creation of legislation is to ensure that in giving the state the levers to protect the citizens, you also protect the citizens from the abuse of their privacy by the state. So that's where I see private sector linking it with the, ex with the legislature as we work with the executive. Thank you very much for those words. Sebastian. Adding to what Samuel was mentioning, I would like to add the fact that there is a very important component in, in involving members of parliament, which is political support and actual political will. I understand that, uh, okay, politicians again, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not seen with the best of the of eyes, right? But uh, it's the actual involvement of private sector, of civil society, and the, the actual involvement of a universities, academy overall, which will make the difference in generating awareness of politicians and decision makers. So I think it's, it's an important role to to uh, generate spaces in, in parliament committees, in uh, open debates, and allow all the stakeholders to be part. Because obviously there, are, there will be conflicts of interest in some aspects, but it's important to reach, to reach certain consensus. So I think those big conversations will, will contribute to bringing these issues, these cybersecurity, cyber threat issues to mainstream political debate. And as we mentioned in the in the parliamentary session this morning, make it to the headlines because today, unfortunately, only after it happens, it makes it to the headlines. And after it happens, after a cyber threat happens, it it can be too late. So that that is when proactive dialogue, proactive debate can kind of change the scenario and and give it a more more positive per perspective. Yet the the silos problem is still there. Yes. Therefore, uh, are there any kind of like international multi-stakeholder initiatives uh, that uh, that could help uh, in this regard in addressing uh, cyber threats? Uh, who would like to? Okay, Jensen, please. I, I can or jump someone, in. Please. Okay. Yeah, um, one of the, the there are quite a number of international stakeholders that we can engage with, um, and I'm going to use Ghana as an example. We've used the Freedom Online Coalition as a critical stakeholder. Um, because, like I said earlier on, cyber threats are borderless, they, 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 they're transnational, and they have no boundaries. And so working with the Freedom Online Coalition, what we've been able to do is we've been able to open up a free access to expression in Ghana, especially online. Again, we work with the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. That's uh, another terror-based or terror-focused coalition that helps us to track movement, especially on the African continent with the growing threats in the Sahel part of, 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 of Africa and, and what threats it poses. So the gift tax initiative is one of the things that as a parliamentary body and as a country, we're using to do cross-border uh, tracking of cyber threats that happen. Again, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is another, is another group that we work with closely because um, you look at the North, the, the, let's, let's call it the Global North, they seem to have taken the lead in terms of putting in place the infrastructure and the mechanisms to protect themselves. There's no need for us in the global South to reinvent the wheel when we can, we can basically learn from the mistakes that they have made and work on the successes that they have chalked. So those are some of the, 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 the initiatives that we use. I mean, they're the UN working groups and all that we are part of, and, and, and that opens us up to a lot of uh, opportunities. The Glacy Plus project, again, under the Council of Europe, is another very critical tool that we have used to establish focal points and focal persons, especially for law enforcement, because previously it would be difficult for you to deal with big tech as a small country in Africa, but using the Glacier Plus project and focal point persons is, able, is, is easy for you to escalate issues on the other end of the world where, 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 where threats arise against our citizens. Thank you, Samuel, for sharing which initiatives have been useful for you and Ghana. Edmund, over to you, then we go to Jimson, then to Andriat. Yeah, I mean, sitting here at IGF, of course, the very important part of uh, a multi-stakeholder initiative is the IGF, but not just the IGF, all the national and regional uh, IGF initiatives. Um, and I think the it's very important to reinforce them and strengthen them and, you know, have them be part of the national, regional, and global discussion 
on on cyber threats and, and these type of issues. Uh, and that is is a little bit on the um, I, I think a, a higher layer, if you will, mm -hmm. but on a more technical layer, of course, the, the key uh, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, in institutions are include like ICANN that I mentioned uh, that takes care of the domain names, the IP address and the protocol uh, parameters. Um, and then the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force that, uh, that deals with the uh, uh, the the protocols that that we use, but also the regional internet registries, uh, you know, here in Africa, you know, around the different regions. I think those are very key ones. And you know, I think building on what what Sam just mentioned, uh, a couple of things. One is local legislation needs to really take care of um, protecting the 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 end users uh, on that on that level, uh, but also to protect the global part of the internet. And there. It, they, on, and that part, on that layer, I think an important part that the parliamentarians can, can do is actually to reinforce these multi-stakeholder uh, institutions that are globally developing the technical layer of the internet. No, thank you very much for, again, stressing especially those from the technical side. We will go to Jimson now, please. Which ones have been most useful for you? Thank you very much. I, I would say plus one to all that my colleagues have said, you know, IGF, ICANN, Afrinic when it comes to uh, Africa needs to be really strengthened. IETF, we've not been playing much role there. Uh, Africa needs to be encouraged to be there. It, it costs a lot, okay, in terms of capacity, capability, and the financial resources. So we can encourage people to be there. Um, but permit me, there's something honorable mention you know, that I would like to respond to. Uh, Honorable, you say that uh, the government, the executive need to bring the bill, okay? Uh, uh, how about the private sector? We are not encouraging the private sector to bring the bill too. Anyway, in Nigeria- the, the Just to clarify sector, that, maybe maybe my Ghanaian bias, because any in Ghana, private members' bills are prohibited if they have a financial implication. And so once there's a financial implication, it must come from government. So maybe I'm speaking from my limited Ghanaian parameter, but if your country allows private members' bills that have financial implications, then why not? Oh, yes, because in, in Nigeria, we have initiated uh, a number of initiatives of IT uh, uh, legislation, even forensics uh, institute to be created, and uh, they listen. Uh, we get the members of parliament are interested in what we propose, and they, we, we have sitting in the round table, and they scale it up, and before you know it, uh, the lower house, uh, upper house pass it, and the executive too, they love it, so we get things moving, just to so keep that in. Thank you. No, but it's important you brought it up. Uh, Andrea. Um, thanks, Teresa. Um, I think the global processes, I won't repeat them. I think they're all very useful. They build capacity, they build relationships. They build cross-technical community, public policy, civil society, other stakeholders, parliamentarians. But I think at the national level, we are really lagging behind in having effective uh, conversations that are not abstract about a collaborative approach to cybersecurity threats, but that are real and that involve transparency. And I think, yeah, the private sector can sometimes, you know, you could have a cyber, and I've seen this happen, uh, ransomware attacks, by the way, the most common threats that we face, um, attacking public infrastructure held by the government, public information infrastructure, government doesn't know what to do, it brings in private sector security consultants, they help them fix the problem, and the public is none the wiser. That, 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 that part of the piece, which is to disclose what the threats were, what the impacts were, to build capacity from the bottom up, to make citizens aware, companies aware, to make civil servants aware of how they need to change their practice to introduce more security um, you know, across the whole, whole system. That doesn't happen. And I think the private sector, and this is why parliaments are so important, because parliaments can, can facilitate this kind of transparency, this kind of information um, sharing. I think cyber resilience, we just have to remember that transparency is part of creating um, resilience against cybersecurity threats. Thank you. Mia Petra, please. Very general short remark here. I think that when we talk about the public discussions, then the prior, uh, parliament is is the one. Of course, we could add here the journalists and then the the news and really uh, echoing the colleagues from different parts of the world. Uh, 
it's too late to act when something serious has happened. So then also that when something is happening to someone else that normally should raise the concerns and then interest. So then then it comes to and then uh, uh, from the for the private sector. Public sector doesn't provide digital services that much themselves. It's most of the time with the private equipment, with the private companies, as is also the uh, cybersecurity services. So they are interlinked and, and, and just we need to be quite cool headed sometimes what is technically feasible. So that also requires some knowledge so that you don't easily get, okay, you cannot do it, that's too much. So then bring it to the part of the normal political discussion and then the responsibilities. I liked very much the word de demystifying it. So what is cyberspace? How to define it? It's the good life, even when you are connected. Thank you, Mark. Uh, please, Sebastian, on this. Question. Just Thank a, you, Mark, a, a quick remark. I don't know if this is this would be a proper uh, multi-stakeholder initiative, but we had a very positive ex experience in Paraguay with uh, a, working with the model law and electronic transfer of all records, which was proposed by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. And basically, it set the ground roots for uh, digitalization, uh, eco uh, digital economy, digital citizenship. And it wouldn't have been possible if there had, wouldn't have been a, a conversation between uh, legislative branch, executive branch. Still, I would say I would have preferred more political will to, to maybe speed up the implementation. We are having a similar approach with uh, data, protect, data protection regulation, which is based on the EU GDPR, which had support actually from the GDPR uh, data authorities. But again, political will is slowing it down and we are kind of uh, altering the order of operations. We are having, we are passing one law before the other, but it's what the, the political context allows us to do. So I, I think these are two interesting initiatives. I heard uh, Africa had a, African Union had a similar model law. Hope we could get something similar for maybe to adapt it to our uh, context in maybe South America, Latin America. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Now, uh, let's bring it back home. Several of you have mentioned IGF as a very important, uh, let's say, initiative platform. Uh, the parliamentary track has been uh, amazing. Yes, because uh, before Berlin, <laughs> we have not seen many of you and your colleagues uh, around. And the fact that you consider it worthwhile to travel often far away, such as <laughs> your case, Sebastian, and for others, um, uh, to the IGF to spend the days here and engage, that's a good sign. Uh, Sorina, if I may kind of say, um, because Sorina Terano has been leading for us also behind this, uh, uh, but um, one of the uh, objectives was to sensitize members of the parliament more about the work of the IGF. And if we now turn it around a little bit, what can you as members of parliament bring to the IGF? Please, Samuel. Well, I'll just, oh, let me and Petra go, ladies first. Okay, ladies first, <laughs> Mia Petra, please. <laughs> Uh, oh yes, uh, we are so much uh, united in our. It, it's there's no like a fight in this panel, which I find one reason uh, to come here that you can reflect with the colleagues from Africa, South America, and really have the same need for uh, protection of the citizens to get citizens on board and they get the life there. But maybe as a Cyprus threads, it's also good to learn the, what the others have experienced and then which kind of systems to build up to do that. And as I said. European Union is already one level higher than the small member, the, the small single uh, member states, as we have legislative power as a European Parliament also to act and to together. But still, Samuel mentioned here, state-sponsored terrorism. Maybe parliamentarians find each other a little bit more easier or facilitate that one because we know also a very good discussion. We had the youth IGF as a members of European Parliament. Uh, knowing that the, the talent is there, but it's very young age that people start looking whether they work for the good or they go for the bad. And that's also very, very important that we get those good talent people to build this globe for more common globe than building it for the threats, war, whether it's a cyber war or whether it's a for the humanity. 
and, and having these uh, very basic questions where our young people will go. And I very much, of course, appreciate the, the, the stakeholders, the, the, of course, business here, uh, but then especially having the NGOs. Because if the NGOs doesn't have a call, if then nobody is asking politicians, government or business to please provide us something that is safe that I can trust too. That if there was a question from a, a colleague from Africa that can we trust the systems? I cannot legislate as a European uh, African countries, but you have to do it. But then we have to find a common ways as well as we are using the same equipment. We are using a lot of same in infrastructure for internet and, and needs to be later too. So then let's be a globalized world and one common internet, but then also having ideas how to make our countries take the responsibilities. Thank you very much. We will go to Samuel, then Andre. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say that Berlin was the birth of fantastic initiative at the IGF, the parliamentary track. Because you get to see a lot of civil society groups and private sector groups meet at various IGFs and have conversations. You get to see the high level conversations with the executive governments, but then there is never a link between the high level conversations that, with ministers and, and presidents and private society or, or pri private sector. The parliamentarians will act as that link, that bridge between those, those two tracks. And what Ethiopia has been, has been a fantastic revelation for us. On the African continent, we realized that we needed to have a concerted effort because one of the dangers of the IGF, let me quickly point out, is it could become very quickly a yearly talk shop for parliamentarians, where we gather once every year, have fa fantastic conversations, and wait till the next year. So on the African continent, we started a fantastic initiative called the African Parliamentary Network for Internet Governance, APNIC, which has brought about parliamentarians from different committees, not just ICT committees, various committees, education, health, social work, ICT, from government side to position side, from 25 African countries. And basically what we do is we have a continuous engagement on the issues that were raised at the Africa IGF that are being raised here. During this IGF sessions, we've had a meeting with the members of the European Parliament led by Mia Petra and, and seeing how we can exchange best practices. She spoke about original equipment manufacturers and the standards that are based, are, are created largely in Europe and, and, and North America. We, we, we use this equipment, but we don't legislate here in Africa what the standards are. But this kind of cross-border or, or, or cross group meetings helps us to learn best practices from them and also helps us to move forward. And then we can learn from each other's mistakes. I made a critical point about the Malabo Convention and I'm gonna stress on it again because it's important. We cannot as an African continent say that we're fighting cybersecurity and providing safety for our citizens if we are not putting in place the right legislations and framework. Because even when law enforcement decides to work on a criminal case, there are no legislations to help in the prosecution. And so please to the African delegates in here, let us go back to our countries and let us make sure that we begin the conversations, put them front and center for the ratification of the Malabo Convention. Like I said, in Ghana, on the, the Budapest Convention, we've ratified it, but we, we decided not to ratify the Convention on Xenophobia and Hate Speech because there were issues in there that were in conflict with our local laws. So we had reservations on that. So you can always ratify the convention with reservations. Kenya has done a different route where they have not ratified the conventions, but they've built their own digital roadmap based on the conventions. But failing to ratify the convention means the convention hasn't been triggered yet. So please let's have that triggering of the Malabo convention. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, you know, uh, one of the problems of having members of the parliament, you can speak in a very convincing way. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for that. We will go to Andriette and then if I'm getting the sign correctly, Edmond. Yes, and we need to ratify it so we can amend it, Honourable George, yes. but I absolutely agree with you. I want to reflect why I think and what I've learned from parliamentarians. Firstly, Honourable Sam George. A few months ago, I had a conversation with him about how we in civil society see cybersecurity and what is difficult for us when we talk to governments. And government just see cybersecurity as national security and often just as regime security. And language, national security. 
But I had a conversation with, with Honorable George, and, and it was so revealing to me because it revealed to me that, of course, it is national security. It's not only national security. But if, as civil society, we don't embrace the fact that it is a national, national security concern, that governments, that parliaments, that other stakeholders are going to relate to it and actually should relate to it as national security, we won't proceed very deeply in our conversation with them. It's not only national security, but national security is part of it. Now, I learned that from talking to a parliamentarian who's in this space. I think the other thing that we get from parliamentarians, I think we're all a little bit disillusioned with democracy sometimes. I think we have this multi-stakeholder approach that we have um, in the Internet Governance Forum that emerged from the World Summit on, on the Information Society, which is a little bit rigid. It talks about business, civil society, government, technical community. And there's a lot of nuance and a lot of specificity that's overlooked in that. All of those groups are diverse within themselves. And, and if we do not evolve and, and make our, our multi-stakeholder processes more subtle, more sophisticated, more targeted, and more inclusive, we're not actually going to reap the benefit from this inclusive approaches to civil society. And I think parliamentarians bring that to the table. They bring the complexity of multi-stakeholder, uh, of multi-party democracy um, governance to the table, and they bring the diversity of, of different perspectives from different parts of the world who are not part of government, but who are close to government and who play an oversight role to the table. I find that extremely valuable. And these are, these are really great remarks, Andrea. Edmond, please. Yeah, um, I just want to off, uh, 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 offer an observation, especially really excited to see the development of IGF and the parliamentarian track. Uh, one thing that I find really interesting is that I, I find a little bit of a parallel with the GAC at ICANN, the Government Advisory Committee at ICANN as it develops. A long time ago, uh, GAC usually have all these closed sessions. So to this time, I was looking at the, 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 you know, the schedule and we see all these closed sessions for parliamentarians. I'm not dismissing, you know, I think closed sessions are, are, are necessary for a lot of, uh, you know, open, open discussion. But I think one of the things that, you know, you were saying how to continue to going forward it would be great to see more open sessions and, and see parliamentarians in action like we have here uh, to talk about some of some of the, the pertinent issues and on internet governance as well. So I think that's, uh, and it's not just in the global level, also in the national and regional uh, IGF uh, uh, activities, they should have, uh, you know, it would be great if parliamentarians would be willing to participate at that level. And that's where, um, as, as Sam has said, um, you know, it's not just a talk shop. You can turn Turn it into a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, discussion that can have results, and that relates to. I don't just want to touch on one thing. I, I think um, uh, Henriette's uh, point about resilience is is very important. I think uh, cyber security. Sci cyber uh, security and threat, I think resilience is the number one thing. You know, it's much more about resilience than than blocking blocking things. Is how you keep it up and running. And resilience has a international level, a global level. Uh, there's a national level. And then I think Henriette mentioned that at at the uh, at the content level, the people, the resilience of the people is really uh, perhaps the most important thing. And that's also where the multi-stakeholder model with the uh, parliamentarians can actually get the word out i think well thank you i made some i think you made some excellent suggestions there on uh, how to how to get parliamentarians involved even more in the in the igf itself and maybe reconsider uh feel uh, here um uh, to open up uh these sessions a little bit more sebastian please uh, or uh, yes sorry it was you jimson and very short remarks now if i may all ask you thank you okay oh uh, well uh, i'm from the private sector not a parliamentarian but uh, there is something i think would be useful uh, because if you cannot measure something, you cannot manage it. So it would be good to perhaps you can have a parliamentary uh, global observatory index uh, that will be able to measure how you're faring, at least since uh, the parliament uh, group was commissioned. Uh, are we, you know, Honorable George talk about, it doesn't want it to be a talk, a talk show or a talk show. So we need to be measuring progress uh, down the line. Thank you. Thank you, James. I, th uh, I, I think 
IGF is sort of like a safe haven for politicians. So, but we have a lot to share from a point of view that we can each share a certain roadmap for a certain experience. In our case, we had a really positive, exp positive experience from Berlin, uh, which led to a multi-stakeholder approach, which led to present uh, a draft of a data protection bill. Still under discussion, still hopefully it will, we, will, we, we expect to, to pass the bill. But it, it led to, it, it came from a very interesting consensus. And I think it's the kind of conversations that we should keep, uh, keep pushing, keep, keep making happen for, uh, con concerning issues such as cybersecurity. Thank you, Sebastian. Any last reflections? Mia Petra, please. Yeah, the cybersecurity index is, is very interesting. You can find it uh, by Googling for the countries. Uh, uh, but then I don't, I don't know the, all the details, uh, um, if, if that can be trusted, but then ITU normally I do trust. Uh, but then uh, on the, because I feel bad that you, you feel that you, it has been something behind the door, so I can reveal you something. And one was that, I hope my colleagues don't mind that because, but it was one that sometimes we in the parliaments think that our foreign services are negotiating something international, cybersecurity agreements, and then it's left there. Whereas it should be brought to the national parliaments and open discussion and commitments by the private sector, NGOs and politicians that now we have this one and, and ratifying this one, it means that it's better life for the citizens. So that was something that we were discussing as parliamentarians that, yeah, we might even vote and ratify it, but public discussion is not there. And we know that we are now close, uh, close to UN uh, and, and UN Pazernas here. UN is doing great job, but not every parliamentarians are aware because sometimes we work too much in silos. I work for the digitalization, you work for the development, you work for the national security, and you work for the journalism, and you work for the female uh, gender issues. It's all cyber <laughs> space. So I hope that we didn't have too much behind the closed doors because it was good. Can I get 30 seconds? Yes, please. Sam. Great. I, I think that in closing, I'm just going to make the point that civil society and private sector should see parliamentarians as your link to getting your voices heard. And, and what, the I, what, what this IGF parliamentary track does, it gives us a once in a year opportunity to interact. I'm, I'm all for more engagements and more open sessions with, with, with the public where they can even ask us questions, where we can have roundtables to discuss policy initiatives. But for me, I think one of the takeaways for me from here is I've met with technical private sector people from Ghana who are attending the IGF, sat with them and said, okay, because of this, when I go back to parliament in Ghana, the parliamentary select committee is going to hold one session with private sector initiatives in Ghana, so we can hear more from them. So that when we're passing legislation, it's not the stakeholder engagement done by the ministry alone, but parliament itself will independently listen to private sector and get your reflection in the bills that we pass. Together, we can make better. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Samuel, also for mentioning these very uh, concrete takeaways. If there are no pressing last remarks, um, please allow me to conclude. I would like to once again remind us who was uh, sitting uh, at the podium and sharing these uh, great insights with you. Uh, first of all, uh, starting from Ferdis back, uh, we had uh, Mr. Edmund, Edmund Chung, uh, the ICANN uh, board member and the CEO of Dot Asia. We had with us uh, Mr. Samuel um, George, uh, member of the Parliament of Ghana. Uh, Mrs. Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, a member of the European Parliament. Mr. Jimson Olufuye, uh, sorry, I will get back to you, Sebastian. Uh, I skipped Sebastian, so, uh, so let's do it now. Apologies for that. Carlos Sebastian uh, Garcia, member of the Parliament uh, of Paraguay. Uh, Jimson Olufuye uh, from the Africa ICT Alliance. Uh, and finally, Andriat Esterhuizen from the uh, APC. Uh, the next steps. Uh, besides, hopefully, planning parliamentary track uh, for uh, for next year uh, will be preparation of an output document uh, that will summarize uh, uh, this uh, roundtable, but also the many preparatory sessions that have been happening uh, in the past days. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank you once again. Uh, thank uh, to all of those uh, joining us online uh, here in the room, uh, and of course, uh, the interpreters, uh, with special thanks um, to the organizers 
organizers of the parliamentary track. Have a, a good rest this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the IGF and see you soon. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.